Glad you guys are here today. We're back in the book of Genesis again. We're looking at chapter 42, the life of Joseph, which is 25% of uh, all of Genesis, takes up the life of Joseph, significant figure in the Jewish people's lives and also in the lives of Israel, saving all Israel from uh, death by famine. And we've watched him go through all of his trials and, and his difficulties, and we've, we're, we're kind of quickly approaching um, the end of the book of Genesis. So we'll keep an eye out. This week, we're going to look at Joseph. I'll, I'll just go to the slides because I'm going to say it twice if I don't. So we've looked at Joseph being tested in all of these various different ways, and it's interesting, sometimes we go through difficulty and hardship and we wonder why. You know, we go through just all sorts of things. It's, it's hard for me to not speak of my own difficulties and pain. But I look at Joseph, who was the only son in his father's eyes and hated by his brothers. Uh, if you've ever had older brothers, you know what it's like to get picked on. Um, imagine that you had 10 of them. And they're all rough. And we know that they're ruthless guys. They're murderers. Uh, some of them committed incest. Uh, they're, they're a real surly group. And he gets thrown into a pit because they hate him. They were going to kill him, their own brother. I, I mean, I don't know what kind of rivalry you guys have, but I don't think I've ever thought of killing my brother. Uh, although I might have, and I have a selective memory. But... He gets thrown in a pit, and then they decide to make some cash off him, sell him as a slave. He gets taken to Egypt. He gets bought by a guy named Potiphar, who's the, king ex, the king's ex, executioner. So he's Pharaoh's executioner, uh, another difficult man. And he is a nobody. But because God has gifted him and because God was with him, and we see it over and over throughout the scriptures, whatever he puts his hand to just turns to gold. He's a, a brilliant administrator, a great manager, and Potiphar sees this and puts him to work, and he basically gives him the entire household. Say, take care of everything. You're good at everything you do, everything in the field, everything in the house. Everything that I have is yours. The only thing he concerned himself with was what's for dinner. Literally the food that was right in front of him. That was the only thing he concerned himself. And Joseph was a star until Potiphar's wife gave longing eyes at Joseph and she grabbed him and said, come and lie with me, which is a line that never works. <laughs> Especially if it's a married woman and a single young man who's got his entire life ahead of him uh, and he realizes, listen, I'm, I'm here because I fear God and I serve your husband and everything that's his, he's given to me except for you because you're his wife. There's absolutely no way and she goes after him every single day, making and accosting him, making all of these innuendos to him, just flat out saying, lie with me. And he says, no, 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 no. And one day she orchestrated all the, the help in the house to be out. And she corners him, grabs his clothes, and she won't let go. And so he takes his clothes off. A Hebrew boy runs out into the street naked in Egypt the first streaker. <laughs> and Potiphar comes home and she is standing there with his coat and he says, yeah, this Hebrew boy that you brought in the house, you bad man, he tried to rape me. And I cried out. And when I cried out, he ran away. And here's his coat. So Potiphar takes him and he's the king, exe he's the, the king executioner, right? Under Pharaoh. He doesn't kill him. He puts him in jail because he knows what kind of wife he has. And he knows what kind of a servant Joseph is. And so he puts him in jail, a life sentence undoubt, undoubtedly, or else his wife is going to give him all kinds of trouble. So at least he's safe. Well, while he's in the jail, he's the new guy, he begins to run everything. He cleans everything, makes sure everything's taken care of. The jailer sees this and says, listen, I'm going to put you to work, young man. He goes, all right, you tell me. You say jump, I say how high. And he does it. And the jailer gives him the keys and says, here you go. 
take care of all the, the prisoners, make sure they get their food, they're all cleaned up, you know, counsel them if they, if they have trouble, you know, straighten them out, make sure that they don't get out of control and everything will be fine. And the jailer's life was easy, he just put his feet up. Joseph did it all. Until one day there were two men from Pharaoh's court who were put in jail. One was the baker and one was the cupbearer. They both had a dream that night. It just so happens Joseph knows dreams because there's a God in heaven who gives dreams and answers what those dreams mean. So he says, what are your dreams? He says, well, I had a dream and I, I took a bunch of grapes and I was squeezing them into a cup and I handed them to Pharaoh and uh, uh, on, the, on the tree, there were three branches. And he goes, oh, well, in three days, you're going to be restored to your position and you're going to be giving Pharaoh his cup again. He goes, great. And then the baker, wanting to take advantage of the good news, says, oh, pick me, pick me, answer mine. He goes, well, what was your dream? He says, well, I had three baskets, three white baskets on my head. They were full of bread and, you know, things for the, the Pharaoh to eat. And birds descended upon my head and started pecking out all the, all the bread and eating all the bread. And he goes, well, in three days, Pharaoh is going to lift you up on a pole and cut your head off. And the birds will eat your flesh. Wow, sorry I asked. <laughs> and so Joseph tells the cupbearer, listen, when you get in before Pharaoh, remember me, okay? Because I didn't do anything wrong. I'm from a land far away. I was taken as a slave. I was put here. My brothers, you know, like it told him the whole story and he put in a plug, relying on this man to put a good word in for him. Do you ever have to rely on somebody to put a word in for you? Don't do it. Like you put, you put that person in your resume and then they call and they can never seem to get a hold of them. Why is that? It's better to get it on paper and staple like 20 of them to your resume. Here, here, here's some references. Oh, that looks good. So anyway, two years pass. The cupbearer forgets everything until Pharaoh has a dream. And it's a scary dream. It's more of a nightmare. And you guys know the dream. And Pharaoh doesn't know what it means. All of his wise counselors don't know what it means. He's all frustrated. He can't go back to sleep because he's afraid he's going to see those zombie cows again. And the cupbearer says, I remember my fault this day. There was a guy. I know a guy. His name's Joseph. He's in prison. I had a dream. You remember the baker? Yeah. Bird food. That guy. He answered our dreams exactly as it. He says, well, bring him here. So they shave him up, clean him up, put some new clothes on him. They put him before Pharaoh. Pharaoh dumps his guts, tells him what his dream is. And he says, you know, I understand that you can interpret dreams. He goes, there's a God in heaven who will give you an answer. So he doesn't take credit for himself. And he always points to the Lord. After he does that, Pharaoh dumps his gut, tells him the dream. He says, oh, well, the two dreams you had are one. For the next seven years, things are going to go really, really well. You're going to have lots of crop, lots of rain. Everything's great. The next seven years are going to be famine. And those years are going to be so terrible that they're going to erase completely all of the plenty from the next seven years. And then Joseph volunteers an answer. He says, you know what you should do? I always love that when people tell me. Pastor Dave, you know what you should do? I usually put my ears up. I listen. I listen very well. But then if I don't do it, they get mad. Those are the people I look out for. But anyway, you know what you should do? You should hire yourself a manager. Increase the taxes to 20% and then take all of the grain and offerings that people bring and store them up. Build silos and make sure it's stored so those next seven years you're not without food. And he goes, that's a great idea. I think you should do that. And he hires Joseph, which is what I do to everybody that has an idea here. It's biblical. <laughs> David Loyley came up to me, I think, in 2016 and said, you know what we should do? I said, what's that? He said, we should have a coffee house. I said, I guess you should get on that right away. <laughs> I, he went, hi, hi, what? Yeah, well, I just kind of wanted to go. I didn't necessarily think I would be starting it. 
But guess what? We're having a coffee house next week. So if you have any ideas whatsoever, no, you can let me know. Dave came from the green room just to accept his applause. So Joseph is going through all of this difficulty and he's finally gotten to the place where he's recognized, where his gifts are seen, where they're now going to be put to use. And so he's an architect. He's building these giant uh, silos, which I showed you last week. They still exist to this day. He collected all of the taxes. So he was chasing people down and storing away things and hiring people and firing people. And he was busy about the land, getting his act together. All of these things come from this. This is what qualifies somebody. When you can go through all of this with your eyes on the Lord and understand that God has a purpose for everything in your life, that's a person you want on your team. Amen? Amen. And so Joseph gets trained. He's tested in all of these ways and he passes with flying colors because God has designed and, and designated him to be a foreshadowing of who Jesus would ultimately be in the perfect. Joseph is in the general. And so we've been looking at the life of Joseph. And that's for all of you who have never been here before. And uh, I haven't irritated yet. So last week, we went over him explaining. He's on a mission. He goes throughout the entire known world of Egypt and he collects and he puts things together. In the midst of that, he has a wife, which he was given, a Gentile wife, and he has two children, Manasseh, which means forget about it. <laughs> and Ephraim, which is fruitfulness. So he's got forgetfulness and fruitfulness as his children and they're markers. They explain he's forgotten all the difficulty and hardship in his parents' house and God has given him fruit in a foreign land with a bunch of foreigners, which is an amazing thing. So you see, he's got these joyous names, these Ebenezer stones in his children. Every time he calls their name, it's a remembrance of what God's done. So it's an interesting thing as he has his life and grows up, but it finally comes. After the seven years of plenty and gathering everything, the famine comes. And by the way, famine always comes, doesn't it? Hardship always comes. Difficulty always comes. There's a time when you'll turn the key and click, click, click. The, the car will not start. There's a time when you're going to wake up and have a new pain. It, the famine is going to come in one shape or another. You know, difficulty is going to come. You're going to find that a friend betrayed you. You're going to have difficulties. Trust me. The, the hard times are going to come. But in, in hindsight of those seven years, it's a good idea to make sure you squirrel some stuff away for those hard days, right? And don't forget those good days that God has blessed you with. And so there's a famine that finally comes. And so they all get busy giving out food to everybody that's there. And of course, we're not supposed to worry about our food. We're not supposed to worry about stuff. We're supposed to trust the Lord in that, which we talked about last time. And, it, and it's interesting because everybody in Egypt went to Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, we need food. What are we going to do? And he goes, I don't know. Go ask Joseph. Which is a typical boss answer, right? Don't ask me. I don't know anything. Go ask Joseph. Because Joseph has all the stuff. It's interesting. It's like when Jesus was at uh, in Cana of Galilee at the wedding and his mother came up and said, hey, Jesus, they ran out of wine. And he goes, woman, what do I have to do with you? A little disrespectful, Jesus. He goes, my time is not yet here. And, Je and then Mary turns to one of the servants and says, whatever he says, do. So if any of you think Mary's cool, you should do what she says. And anything that Jesus asks you to do, that's what you should do. So you know who to go to when you, you have difficult times. By the way, this is one of the granaries that Joseph constructed. And that temple that is behind is actually dedicated to his God, which is a pyramid. So you guys can look that up online if you're curious. He becomes the savior of the world, much like Jesus was when Jesus came. And so he's the foreshadowing or the archetype of Jesus when he comes. 
So we talked all about that last week. So this week, we're going to talk about the family reunion. You remember his brothers who hated him, wanted to kill him, and sold him off as a slave? Well, they're going to show up at his doorstep because they're hungry. Because famine has hit the entire known world over there. And they've run out of food. And it's funny, they haven't gone to Egypt. Verse 1 of chapter 42 says, Then Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. And Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? That sounds like a dad thing. <laughs> and he said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's 10 brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, this is the scripture. This is what the Bible says. And there are all sorts of wonderful things that you can find if you read it slowly. And so first thing dad says is, why are y'all looking at each other? <laughs> why are you looking at each other? You know, they're like, So what's all this looking at each other going to do? Nothing. Guess what? Get your act together, pack up the camels, and go down to Egypt and get some food. Well, it's easy to say. It's, it's not like going to the Wawa. It's, it's like 300 miles away. So 300-mile trip, you're, you're looking at like a six-week round trip to go get food. So like by the time you get a Happy Meal, it'll be gone. <laughs> you know, by the time you get back. The fries for sure. So... He says, don't look at each other. It's interesting. Why, why are they just looking at each other instead of going to Egypt? They have a brother there. They have a brother there who they sold into slavery. And they don't want to be reminded of what they've done. You see that? It's like going to a place where you know you're going to see that person. Or you just might see that person. It might be a store. It might be church. I hope not. I don't, I don't want to go to church. I can't handle the drama today. I'm going to have to deal with that person. But see, they don't go, I think, in part because they don't want to face their own mistakes. They don't want to be reminded of that they sold their brother off. That's all they need. You know, traveling as a pack of 10, going to get food as they look around and suddenly the person bringing their food is Joseph. And he goes, here, guys, try some of this. <laughs> oh, it's Joseph. Don't eat the grain. It's spoiled. You know. <laughs> and so what they do is they just sit around and look at each other. It's interesting how guilt will completely make you freeze and be unable to make simple decisions because you have a guilty conscience. So... That's what I see, but what do I know? So he says, guys, stop looking at each other and get down there, except for Benjamin. You see, when Joseph left, he was thought to be murdered by an animal. There's a new favorite. The new favorite is Benjamin, because he was the son of his wife, whom he loved. Out of the four wives, she was the one that he really bargained for, really loved, and he is the last vestige of his connection to his wife. He's got a new favorite. You guys can go because you're expendable. <laughs> so you see, he still has a favorite. Don't play favorites. Can I get an amen? amen? Don't play favorites in your family. Your kids are all unique and you created them. So deal with it evenly. So here's this telling boundary that he won't let Benjamin go. It's an interesting thing because God knows that he has this inordinate attachment to Benjamin and he's going to make sure that he doesn't keep hold of Benjamin. We'll read the rest of the story for those of you that don't know it. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. And it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him, their faces to the earth. 
that sounds very familiar. You remember Joseph's dreams. He has one particular dream where there are these sheaves of wheat. It's interesting they're coming for grain, isn't it? There's these sheaves of wheat and they all bow down to his. Except it's not exactly right, is it? Because there's one missing. Benjamin. So they go and who do they stand before but their brother who they don't recognize because he's shaven, which is what they do in Egypt. Uh, probably a little eyeliner, <laughs> funny looking headdress, you know, on a bald head. People look different when you take all the hair off. You ever see a hairless cat? <laughs> Scary. So they go and they meet Joseph. And Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Well, I would, he could have their, all their heads chopped off, right? And he said to them, and by the way, he's speaking Egyptian. Where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And so Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And then Joseph remembered the dreams in which he had dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see my, the nakedness of the land. So he accuses them of being spies. You know, you see a big bunch of guys wandering and they suddenly enter your country. It's like, I went to the gym the other day on Friday and there was a gang assembling in front of the gym. I mean, there had to be 18 of them. Kids. I was like, it's going to be trouble. Because they all came in and started working out and I couldn't get on any machines. But I knew there would be trouble. But it wasn't the kind I thought. He's testing the hearts of his brothers and he's watching them with curiosity and cunning. He's going to see how they react. These are guys who wanted him dead. These are guys who sold him off and made money off of his skin. And now they're coming to him for food. What would you do? Oh, so you suddenly need me, huh? It's interesting. Not many of us would have the grace that Jesus has on us, although we should. So he's going to test them. Proverbs 20 verse 8 says, a king who sits on the throne of judgment scatters all evil with his eyes. Uh, any of you, well, I won't ask. If you have ever gotten a ticket for going too fast or for some other strange thing and you've had to go to court, any of you, I won't ask. I know some of you <laughs> have been to court and it's an intimidating thing, right? You go before the judge and you go to say something and he might cut you off and you're like, okay, I will not speak until spoken to. And there's a decorum, right? You don't speak out of turn. Now, in these days, if you speak out of turn, they just say, off with his head. Next. That's called absolute power and it corrupts absolutely. That's why it's good to be in a democracy even though it's all jacked up. Anyway, a king who sits on his throne... A throne of judgment scatters all evil with his eyes. In other words, you better not lie. <laughs> You're going to be in deep trouble if you do. True reconciliation requires humble confession and sincere repentance. I'm sorry is a cheap counterfeit. You know, you get in an argument. And then you go, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That means nothing. I'm sorry just means I'm calmed down now. I got it out of my system and I'm going to act civilly toward you now. That's what I'm sorry means. You know, it will happen again. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's going to happen again. Because I'm sorry is a very shallow way to just say, can we just forget about this and move on? Okay, no problem. But can I borrow 50 bucks? No, you can't. I told you, you can borrow, you know. Then you're back in the argument again. True reconciliation requires humble confession and sincere repentance. I'm sorry is a cheap counterfeit. And these guys don't even know who they're standing in front of. Proverbs 24, 26 says, an honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. An honest answer 
is like a kiss on the lips. Honesty is such a rare thing that it's refreshing to hear honesty, even if it's something like, hey, your fly is down, <laughs> or your guitar is out of tune, your, your, your A string's a little out, you know. It's refreshing to hear truth, and we should be people who are looking forward to hearing truth, whether it's something you like or something you don't, because the opposite is really much worse. For people to say all manner of good things to you and they don't mean it? Oh, no, I know. I would rather have somebody tell me the truth to my face than tell the truth to my neighbor behind my back. An honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. I've occasionally watched what's going on in Congress and people get asked questions and there are so many thousands of ways that they inch out of giving an answer. So would you say it's your job to do this and that? Well, and then they go off in another direction. They don't answer the question. Have you, ever, have you seen this? Why are these people so rich off our money? They learn how to speak, that's why. They don't answer questions, honestly. It's good to hear an honest answer, isn't it? I'm kind of getting hungry to hear an honest answer. Well, they said to him, no, my Lord, we're not spies, but your servant, your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. But we said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. They're honest men. But Joseph said to them, it is as I spoke to you, saying, you are spies. Interesting. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. It's the glory of God to keep things secret, but it can be our privilege to uncover something. And you see, Joseph is trying to uncover something and he asks them for a response when he says, you're spies. And they go, no, we're all brothers, one father. And they said that twice, which, you know, if you say something more than once, it's got to be true, right? No. That's like finding something on the internet. It's got to be true. So, He's going to try to figure out what's going on. Now, what comes out of their mouth tells us a few things. No, we're not spies. We're honest men. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, are these honest men? <laughs> they call themselves honest men. They're murderers. They're incestuous. They're treacherous. They're deceitful, law-breaking liars. That's who they are. But... You see, Joseph now knows that their heart is not ready for reconciliation because it takes a deep humility to have reconciliation. And these guys aren't ready to be reconciled. If Joseph just popped his hat off and said, ta-da, it's me, it's Joseph, they're not ready to hear that yet. Their hearts aren't ready to hear that yet. And so it's a little like watching a match of tennis. You're spies. No, you're not. You're spies. No, you're not. You're spies. No, you're not. And so they give a little bit of information each time. And they say, we're, we actually have one other brother, Benjamin. He's with our dad. Interesting. It's interesting. And in this manner, you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless the youngest brother comes here. Uh-oh. Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in the prison for three days. Three days. Interesting. I have a theory. I think Joseph was in that pit for three days. I think what he's trying to do is enable their heart to have a little compassion by having them go through some of the things he went through. 
I don't know. So off to prison they go, and you're going to send one of you home. Now, that's, that's going to really freak Dad out, because Dad didn't want to send Benjamin anyway, right? Because he goes, I don't want to send him because something might happen. Guess what? Something happened. Three days in isolation with the co-conspirators. Can you imagine the conversation of the brothers in prison? It's your fault. No, it's not my fault. It's your fault. Well, you wanted to kill him. Yeah, but it was your idea to sell him. Can you imagine the conversation? That's why all this is happening. Because they're guilty men before God, and God knows. God's on them, right? Remember when they threw Joseph in the pit? I think he was there for three days. And Joseph said to them on the third day, do this and live. For I fear God. If you are honest men, <laughs> let one of your brothers be confined in the prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine, uh, grain for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me. So your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. So Joseph said, I, I fear God. Well, that's a good thing because he's not going to do anything really rash. And I want you to notice that they are being tested to see if they're honest men. You know, somebody, somebody said this morning, hey, Dave, how you doing? I said, I'm good. And then I thought and I said, no, I'm not good. <laughs> I'm feeling well perhaps was a better answer. I don't have cholera, dropsy, diphtheria that I know of. And capital punishment was the punishment for spying and he just made an accusation and they are to prove themselves as honest men or they will be found guilty. So you're guilty until proven innocent here in this, in this place. And it's like that in this country too, quite often unless you're found guilty and you happen to have a famous name and then it doesn't matter. So, and he modifies their sentence. If you remember, he sent them all to jail, but he's not going to keep them all in jail and send one back. He's going to let them all go home except for one. So one of them is going to be kind of the uh, sacrificial lamb, if you will, caring for the state of his family. Joseph realizes if I keep everybody here and one guy goes back, he's not going to bring enough grain to keep Benjamin and my dad and the household going. So what I'll do, I'm, I'm imagining. I'm teleporting my mind into Joseph's mind. I'll send them all back with all their grain and just keep one guy and see if that's enough for them to come back. You know when you give a down payment for something? None of you ever do that. Okay. Well, this is the way some business works. You have to give a down payment on something, like a house. Any of you own a house? Any? Uh, only a few of you. The rest of you are homeless. Okay. So when you get a house, you need a down payment. You can't just walk in and say, I want to buy the whole thing, you know, plus I want to take out 50 grand, um, put it in my pocket, and I'll finance all that and make payment. You, you, know, you have to have a down payment because if you go belly up the first payment, the bank says, thank you very much for the down payment. We now own your house. That's why. So you have to put a down payment. So this guy's like a down payment that they have to come back. You know, if, if somebody says they want to buy something of yours and they give you $5, you might never see them again. But if it's a human life, chances are they're coming back, right? Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us. and We would not hear. Therefore, the distress, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them saying, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them. For he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept. And then he returned to them again and he talked to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. So what they're doing is they're having an argument in front of Pharaoh. They just got pulled out of jail. 
One's going to prison. Notice they're not, they're, they seem to be trying to figure out who's to be the one that's going to go to the jail. Well, it's not me. I, I, well, it's not me because I, well, it's not me. Typical boy stuff. And they know this is all happening because of what they did to Joseph. And they're right because he's standing right there. And he knows Hebrew. And he understands every word they're saying. Isn't it? I find it amazing. You girls go and you get your nails done. And very often they're like oriental, like all of them are oriental. And they, they ask you questions and, you know, you get your, and then they carry in a conversation. You know, hey, you know, they have a whole conversation. <laughs> And you have no idea what they're saying. They could be saying, you know, get a look at this fancy guy with his nails. Look at this. You know, they could be saying whatever. You don't know. But see, Joseph is listening in and he knows their language. He knows every word. And he hears that they're talking about him, that they get it. This is all about what they did to Joseph. And they've been carrying this. And this is a good 20 years later. They're carrying this. They're carrying the guilt of what they've done. And I'm sure it has caused any number of fights at home. Because that's what sin does when you carry it and you don't confess it and you don't repent of it. And so in their sight, he ties up Simeon. Reuben says, I told you so. I told you. I told you not to do it. I told you. You love that guy, right? And Simeon gets, is the one that gets imprisoned. Why Simeon? If you remember, it was Simeon and Levi who took up swords and slaughtered an entire town. This is a treacherous dude. First of all, under the sight of religiosity, he goes, oh, we well, all have to get, you know, got to nip the tip. You got to get circumcised. And then we'll let you intermarry, you know, with us and us with you, which was a complete lie. And then when they were in their pain, when they were on their beds, racked with pain, recovering from getting the most sensitive piece of your skin removed, they invaded and killed every man, took all their wives and children and their possessions. Simeon and Levi, treacherous dudes. So Simeon ends up going in the locker. And so he's all alone in the prison. Interesting. It's a familiar setting, isn't it? Because that's where Joseph was in the very prison where Joseph was. It's funny when you walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, how you feel their pain, right? So this is the first of six times that Joseph weeps. He does it openly. So men, big boys do cry. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain to restore every man's money to his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. And they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened the sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money. And there it was in the mouth of his sack. And so he said to his brothers, my money has been restored. There it is in my sack. And then the heart, their hearts failed them. And they were afraid, saying to one another, what is this that God has done to us? Have you found a sack of money? Wouldn't you be happy? But they find a sack of money, not just in one, but in every single one of them. All their money was returned to them in the grain. Oh no, now we're thieves. We've been set up. These guys are getting more humble by the moment. And they were all afraid. They weren't thrilled that they got their money back. They were afraid because now they're thieves or they can be accused of it. Then they went to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan and told him all that had happened to them saying... This is a review. The man who was Lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies in the country. But we said to him, we are honest men. We are not spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father, one who, uh, who is no more and the youngest who is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then this man, the Lord of the country, 
said to us, by this, I will know that you are honest men. Leave me one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your households and be gone and bring your youngest brother to me. So I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you that you may trade and you may trade in the land. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in the sack. And then their father saw the bundles of money and they were afraid. They were afraid. Even their father was afraid. They're going to kill all my sons and they've come here to take Benjamin. It's bad enough that Joseph's gone. Now I'm going to lose them all. Lost his wife, giving birth to Benjamin, and now he's going to lose the last vestige of love he has. It's kind of a rotten family situation. <coughs> There's a story, and by the way, this is from the 1800s, this magazine. In 1867, Sir, Conan, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle creator and author of Sherlock Holmes series, sent a telegram to 12 men of great virtue and respected in society. The telegram read, flee, all has been discovered. Within 24 hours, as the story goes, all 24 had fled the country. <laughs> How many of you have heard this? Sir Conan, none of you. Okay, good. Well, this is new. That's why you're here. It's interesting because this was attributed to uh, Sir Conan Doyle, but it turns out that it may have just been a practical joke. Uh, the actual newspaper article here from 1867, uh, the, the date is on this magazine right here, 1867, says that he actually gave uh, one of these letters to an archdeacon and said, flee, all is known, all is discovered. And the guy disappeared and they never saw him again. So whether any of it's true or none of it's true, the bottom line is every single one of us knows that we're sinners, don't we? We know that if somebody said, I know. And they said, what do you know? I know what you did. I know what you're doing. I know. You didn't talk to my wife? I know. Can you imagine? Boy, that... I can hear all your brains working overtime. I can hear hearts racing. If somebody actually knew all the things that you thought or that you had done, it's an amazing thing. And God does, and he loves you anyway. He came and died for you anyway. So I imagine they're like that. You know, all is known, flee at once. They find all their money in their sacks, and they're in deep stuff because they're trying to prove themselves to be honest men. They said it four times. We're honest men. We're honest men. We're honest men. I think thou dost protest too, too much. <laughs> By the way, it's also accredited to Samuel Clemens, who you know as Mark Twain. He says here, I once sent a dozen of my friends a telegram saying, flee at once, all is discovered, and they all left town immediately. So he's taking credit for having done that as well, but I don't think he did it. I think it was long before him. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 24 tells us this, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Heaven is going to be full of sinners who have been forgiven. Amen. The only difference between those people and the people in hell is the people in hell have not asked Jesus for his forgiveness. It's the only difference. Except during our life, we have the benefit of God doing a work in our heart and our minds and making us new creatures in Christ Jesus and bearing fruit for his name. Amen? Amen. And then our life changes. But the only difference between the occupants are you have sinners in heaven, you have sinners in hell. The only difference is what Jesus did on the cross because we've all sinned. You say, well, you know, if, if, I were, if I stood at the gate of heaven and God asked me, hey, why should I let you? I say, well, I'm a pretty good guy. 
I never killed anybody. Well, these guys couldn't say that. I've never stolen. Well, these guys can't say that either. I, well, I've never committed incest. Well, some of these guys can't say that either. And yet these are the people God picked. These are the people God picked. Amen. This is a person God picked. I don't believe it either. It's hard to believe. Anyway, that's what uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle looks like. So if you happen to see this guy, that's not him, but it looks a lot like him, doesn't it? You can call him Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Anyway, verse 36, uh, Jacob, Jacob, their father said to them, you have bereaved me. <laughs> Thanks, dad. It's not our fault, dad. You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. He's counting him as dead, by the way. And you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. He's got some severe depression issues. Then Reuben spoke to his father saying, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Did I not say these are treacherous people? He's... It's like, I swear to God, I swear on my mother's grave. I, I swear on all that is alive. I swear upon the earth. I, that's what he's trying to do, right? I'll, I'm going to do this because I don't want you to kill my sons. That's essentially what he's saying. But why would you say such a thing? Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you and put him in your hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you. I'm not letting Benjamin go. For his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. He's saying, if anything happened to Benjamin, I would absolutely die. I would just give up my life. It's done. I would be, for the rest of my life, I would be miserable and unhappy. That's great. That's somebody you want to spend time with, right? Have dinner with, live, live in the same tent with. That's, that's really what you want. So he says, I'm not going to let Benjamin go. Why not? Because he doesn't trust God. He's blaming his sons for all this. Strangely, he's blaming his sons for all this. Because they are guilty. But he doesn't know for the right reasons. Proverbs 3, 5, and 8 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. See, what, what he's not doing is trusting God with his stuff and with his kids and with his life. And I think the Lord, like, like a shucker would put a knife inside of a, an oyster. I think he's trying to pop Benjamin loose from him so he doesn't have that inordinate attachment. So God's at work in several different areas throughout this story. Next week, it's family reunion part two. Because... You guys may or may not know it. Dad just assumes he's dead. I'm not sending my son. So you know what's going to happen? They're going to run out of grain. They're going to be sitting there one day and their stomachs will be grumbling and they'll all be looking at each other. He's going to say, why are you looking at each other? Because we got to go down and get our brother, right? No. <laughs> he's, they're leaving him to rot. How would you like to have a brother like that? Didn't do anything wrong. He's in prison and you're just going to think he's dead and leave him there because it's too hard for you to let your little Benjamin go. Boy, you know, we can become attached to things so easily. We tend to love things and use people instead of using things and loving people. It's an easy exchange to make. I don't know what the Lord's doing in all of your lives, but I hope you're enjoying this. I hope you're seeing some of yourself in the story. 
praying that God brings us all along. <laughs>